entered the spine-chilling world of H.H. H. Holmes, America's first documented serial killer. With a confirmed death toll of 27 and many estimating hundreds more, Holmes' sinister web of murder still haunts us today. He preyed on young women, men, and children alike, leaving no one safe from his twisted desires. Prepare for a chilling journey as we unravel the grisly truth behind his notorious crimes and reveal the enigma that is the man history believes to be the creator of the infamous Murder Castle, a uniquely horrifying creation designed by Holmes to facilitate and industrialize his murderous rampage. We advise you to watch till the end as the most shocking revelation which will shake your entire understanding of H.H. H. Holmes is unveiled then. Born Herman Webster Mudgett in 1861 in Gilmantown, New Hampshire, Holmes showed intelligence and cunning from an early age. He excelled academically, graduating high school at the age of 16. In 1882, Holmes enrolled at the University of Michigan Medical School, where he began to hone his skills in deception and fraud. He started by stealing cadavers from the school's dissection lab then using these bodies to stage accidents and collect insurance money. By the time he graduated in 1884, Holmes had become proficient in anatomy and dissection, skills that would later serve him well in his murderous pursuits. After graduating from medical school, Holmes moved to Chicago and adopted the alias Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. It was under this identity that he began a career as a con artist. Holmes engaged in various scams and fraudulent activities, including selling fake medical cures, forging signatures, and committing financial fraud. He quickly developed a reputation for his criminal exploits and his ability to evade capture. Holmes's personal life was just as deceitful as his criminal career. He married multiple times, often without legally divorcing his previous wives, and had many mistresses. Holmes used his charm and manipulative skills to woo women and gain access to their financial resources, only to abandon them when it suited his needs. This pattern of polygamy and deception would become a hallmark of Holmes's life, with some of the women he was involved with eventually becoming his victims. As Holmes's criminal career progressed, so did the severity of his actions. Many believe the construction of the murder castle marked a turning point in Holmes's life as he shifted from a career in simple fraud to one facilitated by cold-blooded murder. Holmes built his infamous murder castle in Chicago. It was reported to be a sinister structure designed for deception, entrapment, and murder. With secret passages, hidden rooms, trapdoors, sandproof chambers, and even a gas chamber, the murder castle was reported to be a macabre masterpiece of deadly engineering. What makes the story of the murder castle so terrifying are the details of its intricate design, tailored to facilitate Holmes' gruesome acts. Each floor of the building reportedly served a different purpose. The ground floor of the murder castle appeared innocuous at first glance. It consisted of retail spaces including a pharmacy, a jewellery store and a barber shop. These businesses served as a front for Holmes' sinister activities and provided him with a steady stream of potential victims. Unbeknownst to patrons and residents, the true horror was reported to lie hidden just above and below them. The second floor of the murder castle was reportedly a labyrinth of deception, designed to trap and confuse its occupants. The living quarters were a mix of small apartments and hotel rooms, rented out to unsuspecting tenants and guests. But hidden amongst these rooms were the death chambers each uniquely designed to facilitate Holmes' murderous desires. Some rooms were reportedly soundproof, lined with asbestos and outfitted with gas lines, allowing Holmes to asphyxiate his victims at will or increase the temperature in the room until his victims cooked alive. Others were equipped with trapdoors that led to hidden chutes, throughout which Holmes could dispose of his victims' bodies directly into the basement. The walls were filled with secret passages, enabling Holmes to move stealthily throughout the building, watching and stalking his prey without detection. The basement of the murder castle was reported to be Holmes' grisly playground, where he could indulge his sickest fantasies. Here he would dissect, strip, 
and clean the bodies of his victims, often selling their skeletons to medical schools or turning their organs into gruesome displays. The basement was equipped with a crematorium, vats of acid, and pits filled with quicklime, ensuring that any trace of the victims could be easily erased. In this sinister space, Holmes also conducted twisted experiments on the bodies, driven by a morbid curiosity and a fascination with death. The basement served as both a laboratory and a charnel house, where the remains of his victims bore witness to the true depths of his depravity. It was reported that the murder castle was designed to be a living nightmare for its unsuspecting victims. Lured in by the promise of employment or lodging, they would soon find themselves trapped in a maze of terror, with no hope of escape. Holmes was a master manipulator and would use charm, deception, and promises of opportunity to entice his victims. Many of the young women who fell prey to Holmes were drawn to the bustling city of Chicago in search of work, and Holmes would offer them jobs in his pharmacy or other businesses on the ground floor of the murder castle. Others would come for the promise of affordable lodging, unaware of the horrors that awaited them. Once ensnared, Holmes's victims would find themselves at his mercy. He would drug them or render them unconscious, then transport them to one of the building's many death chambers. With the victims trapped and disoriented, Holmes would subject them to an array of terrifying ordeals. For some, it would be quick and painless. For most, a slow and agonizing end. As the victims faced their final moments, the true horror of their predicament would become painfully clear. Some would be sealed inside the soundproof room where they would succumb to asphyxiation from the gas lines Holmes controlled. Others would be trapped in a chamber with iron-plated walls that could be heated, slowly cooking them alive. Those who attempted to escape would find themselves lost in a maze of false doors, secret passages, and disorienting hallways. Their frantic efforts to find safety would only lead them deeper into the labyrinth, where Holmes would be waiting to deliver the fatal blow, personally. In the aftermath of their deaths, Holmes would coldly and methodically dispose of his victims' remains. The bodies would be stripped of flesh, their bones meticulously cleaned and often sold to medical schools. Those he deemed unworthy would be incinerated or dissolved in vats of acid, erasing any trace of their existence. Holmes's meticulous methods ensured that many of his victims would never be identified or given the dignity of a proper burial. One of the interesting theories which has arisen more recently is that H.H. H. Holmes was actually Jack the Ripper and returned by boat from the United Kingdom just days after the last of the Ripper's murders. Evidence is scant and opinion divided on this allegation. In 1896, after years of evading justice, Holmes was finally captured and brought to trial. Although he was only convicted of one murder, he admitted to 27 and, in his posthumously published book, appeared to lay claim to hundreds more. His trial and subsequent newspaper coverage exposed America to the concept of the modern serial killer. His reign of terror didn't end with his death, and even over 100 years later, the name H.H. H. Holmes is still a name to conjure dread with, not least because of his penchant for saying such chilling things as, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. It's important to note that conducting an accurate assessment using hair psychopathy checklist requires in-person interviews, access to criminal records, and other supporting documentation. As H.H. H. Holmes is no longer alive, it's not possible to provide a definitive hair psychopathy checklist score for him. However, Based on the available historical information, we can attempt to provide a rough estimate of how Holmes may have scored. The PCLR consists of 20 items, each scored on a scale of 0 to 2, with a maximum possible score of 40. A score of 30 or above is diagnostic of psychopathy. After reviewing H.H. H. Holmes's writings and known history, it is my assessment that he would have scored 35 out of 40 on the modern hair psychopathy checklist. This more than diagnoses him as a psychopath. 
There's just one problem with all of the above. Most of it is simply myth and fantasy, and bears only a passing resemblance to what actually happened. The H.H. Holmes portrayed by thousands of true crime websites, YouTube videos and forum posts, is a factitious creation of 19th century reporters who wanted good copy, and later writers who didn't do their due diligence and examine primary sources. Over time, the myth grew and replaced the facts. H.H. H. Holmes was a serial killer, but he did not kill hundreds. He almost certainly didn't even kill the 27 he confessed to. The murder castle simply wasn't. Yes, the basement was almost certainly used to get rid of the evidence of his crimes, but the stories of specially designed murder shoots, rooms with poisonous gas systems designed to asphyxiate victims, hot plates designed to slowly cook victims, and soundproof torture chambers are flights of 19th century newspaper reports magnified and exaggerated over the years until the modern understanding of H.H. H. Holmes and his methods bears only a passing resemblance to what actually happened. The lesson of the H.H. H. Holmes case and the murder castle for forensic psychiatry and psychology and true crime fans is the ever-present danger of allowing a good story substitute for the facts of the case. H.H. H. Holmes is infamous for being one of America's most prolific serial killers. We would argue that he should be more infamous as a cautionary tale of how telling and retelling a story can create a myth. We are including links to books used during our research in the description of this video if you are interested in reading further about this fascinating case. These are affiliate links, so if you use them, we will receive commission, which we will use to improve the quality and quantity of videos. Thank you for joining us on this not as terrifying as expected journey into the world of H.H. H. Holmes and the mislabeled building. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more true crime content. On the screen, you'll see a link to a video YouTube thinks you'll enjoy and a playlist from our crime and psychiatry channel if you'd like to see more from this channel. Please leave any comments or questions in the comments section and we'll do our best to answer them. Also, do tell us if you'd enjoy a longer, more detailed video about H.H. H. Holmes and the myth of the murder castle, as this is just the result of our scoping research into potential future cases. Until next time, take care and stay safe.